Welcome to the NYU Steinhardt Jazz Interview Series, and tonight our special guest is the great saxophonist and flutist, Jerry Dodgian. Jerry, it's a pleasure having you here tonight. My pleasure. And, Thank you. and I just I want to start by talking about your your early career, how you got started in music. Okay. And then as we progress, so you're from California. Uh, Richmond, California. It's a. Uh, on the East Bay in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and what year were you born? 32. 1932. Yeah. Wow. Day before yesterday. <laughs> 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 so what was what was it like growing up and discovering music in probably the the third, late 30s and 40s? It was, it was great. Oh, really great. I, I have I learned in uh, the saxophone in beginning band and uh, uh, in ninth grade uh, and uh, I I th well, I thought well, I thought I was progressing pretty well because the guy next to me didn't practice at all <laughs> so so. All I had to do was practice a little bit, and I, next to him, I was okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, did you uh, pick up the saxophone because you heard uh, a, another saxophone player, a jazz musician? No, no. I, I, I turned. Uh, <laughs> and, and during one grade. In school, they said anybody interested in, in uh, playing an instrument, raise your hand. So I raised my hand, and they said, uh, "What instrument are you interested in?" And I said, "The saxophone," because I'd heard this the sound before, and. I asked what, what that was that sound, and they told me. But the answer to my question was, uh, sorry, the school doesn't have any saxophones. You have to bring your own. So as a, a, an 11-year-old <coughs> turning 12 in Healdsburg, California, it was uh, 60 miles north of Richmond uh, in, a, in the wine country now. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I picked prunes for half a saxophone. <laughs> I, I picked prunes for two and a half weeks uh, and made sixty dollars, and I made a deal with my mother and, fa and father that uh, the other, if they would join me, that this was half a sacrifice. <laughs> and so they did join me, and uh, uh, that was the beginning of my saxophone, and. And the uh, begin beginning band was delightful to me. And you've, you've eaten prunes ever since. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my, I'm telling you. Wow. It's unbelievable. So at what point did you decide you wanted to be a musician, professional? Well, uh, as, as soon as I got good enough to play in bands, uh, I thought that this would be a, a great uh, way to make a living if I keep going. I fell in love with the music and and f s some other musicians my sa my age and learned a lot and they kept learning. Well, let me ask you, maybe 1950 or 18 years old. Yeah. My math is correct. 
Okay, so fine. that's, uh, where were you in the 50s? Um, I was still living in Richmond and uh, 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 Because the reason I say this, and you're in, in the California West Coast, and, and that's considered at that time period like the, the cool school, the West Coast movement. Yeah. You'd have guys like Jerry Mulligan and Chico yeah. Hamilton and Chet Baker. Yeah. Did you see any of that happen? Yeah, I heard the, that group. And uh, there was no piano, you know, that, that was interesting. And uh, Did you see them at The Hague? No, that's in LA, LA. But, but I saw them in the San Francisco area. They, they played there mm -hmm. quite often as well. So how did that affect you? Well, uh, positively, yeah. <laughs> I thought it, it was interesting. You know, I, I, it's hard to say something was interesting without uh, uh, explaining a, l a little bit, but that, that, that there, there, there was no piano. That was my first pianist group mm -hmm. to hear. And, uh, and that was probably shocking because there was always piano. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and since then, uh, it's no big deal to see a group without a piano. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 if, if, even if it was a guitar or a piano, this is, this is usually something. And, and, oh man, wow. You, you took me before the back of that yeah. thought, wow. So wow. what would have been uh, the, the first important gigs that you had that you said, I'm, I'm really doing it now. Oh, well, uh, there was, we played for dancing at the, uh, some community center in, in Richmond, and uh, the people would come and dance, but we, we played in a band, you know, and you know, it was not my band, it was just a band. And uh, one of the uh, one of the officers in the local musicians union used to have a band, and he had and a, a book at home with all kinds of arrangements and. Things. And uh, right, once in a while, we, we, we'd get together and re go through some of his music. And it kind of was kind of old-fashioned to us, but they had things like the Sheik of Arabi and things like you know, that in, in, a, in a, wow. Anyway, <laughs> oh Dave, this is great. <laughs> well, let me let me hit you with some people that you worked with to get your perspective, your yeah. perception of them. Uh, uh, Gerald Wilson. Oh, Gerald Wilson. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I would say if I had to have a favorite to start with, I would have chosen him. Mm -hmm. And you ask anybody, whoever played with them, about him, and they, he'll, they, they all, everyone loved him. It was amazing. And, and nobody had to teach me uh, to be respectful or to, to, to anybody because I played with Gerald, oh my God, oh man, that was so beautiful. What a way to start, I would say, if you, to start and Gerald Wilson becomes one of your first band leaders, you're lucky. And 
I'm a lucky guy. Okay, I really am. Well, what made uh, Gerald so great? Well, he was he was a great person, and he 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 included everybody in the band when they made the, the, the decisions or and, and he had questions or anything, and and he. he he, he let you feel that you belonged, mm -hmm. and 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 the, the, the we're glad you're here, and uh, what, what a way to for a young kid to to get the, that message from a well-respected band leader. Oh my God. <laughs> and he had credentials. Mm -hmm. I mean, he played with and wrote for Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Jimmy Lunsford. And Jim, Jimmy Lunsford. And at first, I used to ask him about those days. And, and uh, oh man. Oh, I'm gonna. It, it, I'm gonna really enjoy this interview because <laughs> I get I get to talk about my favorite people, and after Gerald, oh my God, I, with Gerald, oh my, he, he was so good, and everybody loved him. I mean, everybody loved him. And he, he, when he, when he needed, needed special favors someplace, he would just ask somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'd get it, whatever it was, you know. Oh, my God. Now, now you've, had, you've had unbelievable experiences playing in a, a broad array of big bands all throughout your life. Yeah. Well, uh, and you're, you're a, a fantastic arranger as well. I love, oh, well. I, I played all of your arrangements. Um, did, what did you carry from, from uh, your first experience with uh, Gerald as being an arranger, as a composer? Wow. Well, the, the thing is, with the, the first thing you learn from Gerald is, is that if you're ever asked to do this, you better include everybody. Mm -hmm. that, that's what, and uh, it was good, good advice, man. You, you, you want to play the saxophone in the saxophone sections and, and, and play in solos and, Everything, uh, and uh, that uh, all that was ahead of me then. Mm -hmm. uh, a whole lot was ahead of yeah, me. Yeah, right. Oh my God! And you know, and as uh, I met uh, more and more professionals along the way, and uh, I asked them how they, did they get started. And they mentioned who they played with and everything. And they, they would ask me, and I would say, Gerald Wilson was my first band, real uh. band leader. And what, I was so proud. Uh. Oh, man, Gerald. <laughs> oh. Well, let me ask you, and I was reading your bio, and it said that you worked with Billy Holiday. Oh. I'm, 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 I said, I'm lucky. I'm a lucky guy. I was 22, and this club had been calling me to come in for three days or two days now and then, and I never paid them much mind. I would go and play, and um, uh, <laughs> Uh, and then when I get the, the, the call, uh, I got the call to, to do two weeks in the club. And I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, 
I got there and found out that Billy Holiday was there. And, you know, it was the marquee, but there was, there was no mar marquee, but the, it was obvious. And, uh, and she was great. Oh, my God. Uh, I, <laughs> oh, man. She was nothing like you, you would expect. I'd, I'd worked with very few singers, and, and, and a few of them were stars in their eyes types. Uh, we thought they were, they were pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Billy was, she was so much fun, and she was so natural, and so, and we talked a lot, and she told me stories. Oh man, she she knew how to get my way. In my ears, she, she mentioned Lester Young. Yeah, oh my God. Oh boy. What did she say about Lester? Oh boy. She told me stories about uh, the time that she was, she and Press were living with her mother. And oh, oh man. Oh, you really take me back. I very seldom tell these stories. And, wow. She, she, oh wow. She was so good. She was good at singing. She was a, a, a great person. She was a, a magnificent woman. And, and she was, she so 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 took me under our wing so a little bit and and told me these stories about press and Count Basing. Oh man, playing with Billy, <laughs> and she said, she said. Uh, when it came to, she, I, I never saw any dope ever, ever around her, but she to, told me stories about smoking, and <laughs> she said, she, she said, in those days we called it gauge. In those days, gauge. She says we called it bush, and. And uh, her mother loved press, and and one day she said, "Billy," her mother says, "I've been saving some money up in the kitchen cabinet. There's I've got seventeen cents in there. Why did you take the seventeen cents and why is press some of the?" those Chesterfields or whatever the smokers smoke, because the, the cigarettes he smokes smell like they're dirty, dirty socks. <laughs> and, 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 and she didn't go on and on. And then she, 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 she was, so somebody told her, uh, her mother what what, what press was smoking, and she she prayed for his soul every every day. <laughs> she loved him, you know. And oh oh my God, that that's a story I haven't told in thirty years. That's a great story. What about Count Basie? Oh boy. Uh, my, I'm a lucky guy. Yes. Yeah, and I knew some of the guys that played with Basie. And Billy Mitchell I knew, and Billy Mitchell called me up one day, says, what are you doing Thursday? I, well, why? I'm not doing anything. 
He said, would you like to record with Count Basie? <laughs> and I said, I, I, I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, Bobby Plater has to take off because he did, the, uh, did an album for uh, a big band album. And, and Billy Mitchell was very important to me for a long time, my God. And, uh, and uh, he, he just talked to me like uh, we've been friends for years. <laughs> and wow. we, I just meeting him, you know? And I thought, wow, what is this? <laughs> Being a professional musician, it's like a private club. Yeah. Everybody is great. And uh, everybody plays good. Every, everybody's a good person. I, the, the, I'm not, I not met any bad people yet. Yet, <laughs> I, you said. I, mean, <laughs> I, I was so lucky. Oh, man. Well, all right, let me move on and we'll, we'll see what your perceptions are now. Yeah. You played with the Benny Goodman Orchestra. Oh, yeah. Yes. So oh. what was Benny like? Oh, boy. That's, that's, that's not an easy answer. But <laughs> not, uh, oh, you know what Trump was like? <laughs> 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 that's a question for him. Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> Now you, now, you had a very special opportunity because you went to, on the Soviet Union tour with yeah. Benny Goodman, so that would have been with Phil Woods yeah. and Zoot Sims yeah. and who, Danny Bank, was he playing Barry? No, no, he didn't, wasn't okay. in the band, Gene Allen. Oh, okay. He played Barry Tone. And, but, <laughs> Danny Bank had played with yeah. Benny before. And, and Danny Bank was a great, uh, he had, had polio when, when he was a kid, and, and he wore one shoe with a, the, the, the sole was the straight, you know. And, and he, he was, he would go, oh, uh, salsa swinger would, would always say, about Danny Bank, he say he's one of my heroes. He, he, he's he, although he played baritone too, but he's you would tell the stories about Danny when he played with the band. For him to stand up with the saxes was tough. You know, he was he had to be careful not to fall down and stuff and but he, he did did fine mm. it, it, he he was uh, one of my heroes too now there's a lot of stories about that uh, benny goodman tour of the soviet union it was <laughs> early 60s and uh, I, I mean, I've heard him from Phil Woods. Yeah. And, uh, oh boy. But what about what about? I never had a chance to meet Zoot Sims. What what was what was his point of view? Well, well <laughs> I, I sat between Zoot and Phil, and uh, my God, <laughs> what a world! Oh my God, and. <laughs> Oh my God! What did they? What did? What was? What did they say? I mean, I, I've heard some stories about uh, uh, Benny or what Zoot had had uh, commented, but I'm wondering what you knew. <laughs> well, I heard 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 most of everything. See, the band was great, but Benny. Well, the band was too good for Benny. He, 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 he didn't progress much beyond the, the 40s with the, his own band. And uh, 
he, 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 he didn't know how to hold this, this band back, but <laughs> was holding it back just by, by, by being there. But, uh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh. oh boy, you, you ask good questions. <laughs> oh boy. So what was Zoot like? What oh, was Zoot like? was great. Zoot was great. He, he, he played great and he was natural. He, totally natural. Uh, he didn't read chord symbols. Did he read music though? Yeah, oh, he yeah. read music, yeah. And, uh, yeah, on sitting next to him, I, they, 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 when a tenor solo came, and I look at his part, and I see the changes, he wouldn't wait till a piano, a piano play. And then after the piano would play, a chord would go, do 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 play him, yeah. But he, he had to hear the piano. So how do you think Zoot Sims would have fared in the Jerry Mulligan Pianolist Quartet? Well, he played, we played with the Jerry That's Mulligan. true, right. Yeah. But was there was a piano by then? Oh, maybe there wasn't? No, no, no piano. How did he, how well, did he do Well, he that? learned to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was amazing. He was totally amazing and totally natural and no and fun loving and and never taking advantage of anybody uh, he was a classic cat he was a, just amazing and Benny's band that, that I think it was, I was the youngest guy on the band and and uh, oh boy oh man well, let me ask if you could finish this story because it's a classic Zoot Sim story somebody asked him how he plays so well while he's drunk while he's drinking while he's drunk <laughs> well he would say he pr drank when he practiced. <laughs> it, it, that was an, it stuck in yeah, that. And, but that, that's not true, but yeah. people would prefer to hear that. Well, let me ask you, the, the lion's share of your recording uh, with big bands seems to have been with the great Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra. Oh, I mean, yeah. some of the records were uh, presenting Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, and the Jazz Orchestra, yeah. uh, presenting Joe Williams with yeah. the orchestra oh, live oh, at the Village Vanguard, Monday night, Central Park North, Basie 1969, Consummation, live in Tokyo, uh, Potpourri, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, um, Manuel De Sica and the Jazz Orchestra, Sweet for Pops, New Life, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis Orchestra with Rhoda Scott, live in Munich. It only happens every time. Oh boy. Tell us about your experience. How did you meet Thad and Mel? Oh, oh well, that, that's what, I never been asked that. Oh, uh, and I met Thad in, uh, right around that time, because he came in, in the, one of the rehearsals with we had we had with uh, that with Benny Goodman, I think I, I, I may be, be wrong, and uh, he he came in with an arrangement or something, and passed it out and we played it and. Uh, I, I, the, 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 the next time uh, I saw him, I said hello to him, you know, he, he was a great. Uh, you know, amongst very good musicians, there is a high level of fine people. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> oh boy. Oh. And with that and Mel, the first piano player was Hank Jones. Mm -hmm. and, and for about three months, and when, when Mel used to pay everybody on Monday night, we, we made $17 or something, and Hank, Hank would just take it, put it in his pocket, and one night he took it out and counted it. He said, this is all we make? <laughs> and, and somebody said, yeah. Or, or Mel said, yeah. And Hank, Hank said, I can't afford to work here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's serious, you know. It's serious, but tongue in cheek. <laughs> and, uh, and another great person, Hank Jones. The, that family, oh my God. Besides Hank, did Alvin ever sit in? Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. And every time he would sit in, he would break Mel's bass drum pedal. Every <laughs> time. Every time. Like <laughs> clockwork. You know, you say you would say you would see Elvin making a waste the, the, the drum set and you would say no, I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you put every time and Mel was so and Mel loved loved uh, Elvin and and that, that oh my God! That. How did how did Thad and Mel form this partnership? Well, they they st used to tell the story, but when when Thad was with Basie, they played at a, a battle of the bands with Stan Kenton when Mel was the drummer with Stan Kenton. And, uh, and the, the story went, the, the, uh, Mel and uh, uh, Thad. Thad got together and had dinner. And, and Mel said to Thad, after the war, why don't you when we start a band or something like that? And uh, that that's 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 a, the one story uh, I always heard. Well, I I had heard too that uh, a lot of Thad's early arrangements were written for Basie, but yeah. they were rejected. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and that's that that's what formed the core of that early yeah, band. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the 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 original a lot of the original parts were for for <coughs> Basie band. Yeah. And uh, uh, <laughs> oh my God! You know, it, it, it was what a trip this is. <laughs> oh my God! coming from Richmond, California, and playing with Count Basie, and, oh my God, he said, oh wow, it's, it's amazing. I, um, well, let me ask you, that I, I've seen all these photographs of the band members in the 60s and 70s, and you guys were pretty hip looking. You'd had the, you had the big 70s sideburns, and the mustaches and the ascots and the bright colored 70s shirts and it's like you guys were really on the scene back then you were trendsetters fashion fashion plates maybe oh uh, i don't know about that but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> the the, uh, the the album covers of the 60s yeah. and 70s were qu quite uh, Fashion conscious, maybe. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> so, but when you were working in uh, with Thad and Mel, that was Monday nights, 
and you were working as a freelance musician in New York. You were probably one of the consummate sidemen of the time. And I know you were on some really important recordings like uh, Herbie Hancock, Speak Like a Child. Oh, yeah. So what, what can you tell us about? That was interesting because it was Thad Jones on cornet, you on alto flute, and then bass trombone were the horns, yeah. right? So how did that come about? Oh boy, it, lots of, oh, I told you I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. I, you, I never called anybody for a job. My phone rang. I, I know. I, I, I'm not kidding. My phone rang, and it was for me. And I have, I was careful to have a pencil, whenever, and I answered phone call with a call to, 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 with something to write down. And some place to be at a time and certain instruments, and I, I didn't. Uh, uh, I wasn't uh, organized to be a instrument uh, multi instrumentalist. Mm -hmm. I liked the saxophone, and uh, the. the, the and you had to play the clarinet, and, and so I took clarinet lessons from different people, and uh, and then the flute started getting popular, and <laughs> I, I I I had some good teachers, <laughs> and I I tell you. Uh, I met Gene DeNovi on one of the many Goodman <laughs> studio dates or something. And uh, he asked me, I hear you're warming up the flutes, you play pretty good. I, uh, I say, I'm working on it. I, I, a lot of guys that I knew took lessons. I knew what to practice, and and the, the funny Gene Denovi came to me. He said, uh, "Will you you want to just take some flute lessons?" Yeah, I say, yeah, yeah. I, I'm in New York. My I should take lessons from a great flute player. He, she said, I'll get you with Julius Baker. I said, no, wow. not yet, not <laughs> yet. <laughs> well, he had his mind set up. He, he made this deal with Julie. He, Julie had made his last recording as a uh, composer. And I asked him, how did Julie do? He, well, he didn't play the music it, uh, like I wrote it, but he sounded good. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> he said there was one place where, where I wrote something, and on the record, he played something different. And I, I asked him, Julie, what did, you, what did you do there? He said, oh, I changed that. It, it, you know, those classical players, really good classical players, yeah. they got away with murder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you're Julia, Julia Spaker, you can play anything. <laughs> right. And the, it, 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 it probably wrote his name in a square and, a, and pointed to that <laughs> phrase. Oh my God! Well, how did how did the uh, alto flute come around for "Speak Like a Child"? Uh, that was uh, Herbie's idea. The mm -hmm. the, the, the flugelhorn, the, the the alto flute, and uh, so it was bass trombone. The bass trombone, and and that's not the. Uh, the Common orchestrations, but 
There was nothing common anymore. <laughs> you never knew what you could expect. Oh my God. Uh, so did, let me, let me ask you a, a question about that session. I heard that Thad Jones may have had some input in those arrangements. Is that true or was that Herbie's arrangements? No, no, it was all the Herbie. It was all Herbie? Or all, oh. of, all of it, yeah. All of that, that one and that one and another one after that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. he, he had his thing of what he wanted him to hear. And, uh, you know, when he played, he could play anything. And, uh, <laughs> So did you get on that session just by somebody calling you out of the blue or because you knew Thad? Uh, uh, well, I knew Herbie by uh -huh. that time. And then he, he called me, mm -hmm. I think. And he said, uh, I have written uh, some for you and the bass trombone and Thad. <coughs> Had you been playing alto flute at that oh, time? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that, uh, I have been playing the flute for a few years, and uh, for some reason, uh, I got an alto flute. I just can't remember. Uh, oh, I know. <laughs> My first time to play in Reno, <laughs> I took my paycheck and went to the blackjack table and won. And I won about uh, $400 and something. I said, I'm gonna buy a, a flute. And I saved, I handed him to the money and I bought an alto flute. And <laughs> it saved my life. I was called to, to play alto flute a lot. And uh, 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 I, I tell you, I'm, I'm a lucky guy. Mm. I'm, I'm not kidding. Mm. And so, so, my God. Well, let me ask you, I have some more people that I want to bring up to you. You were on a record uh, called Stoneflower, uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim. Oh, yeah. Did you get a hangout with Joe Beam? Well, uh, not exactly, but but uh, <laughs> he and uh, what's his name, uh, the, the German writer, oh, Klaus Ogerman. Klaus Ogerman, yeah. and uh, drank vodka a lot, a lot. and a lot, and <laughs> they, they go they go into the local liquor store and. Uh, the, the owner said, hey, you guys drink vodka? And he gave him a, a deal of 10 cases or something. <laughs> and they, they took it home and they drank it. They, they drank it the 10 cases. <laughs> and well, and I, I never hung out with him, but I know the story about he and, and Joe Beam drinking together. Oh man, he got to be young to do that. Mm. Oh man, oh boy. Wow, well, it's a great record at any. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, oh man. All right, I'm not done asking you questions here. <laughs> Don't be done. Okay, what what about Oliver Nelson? Oh, another one. You know, favorites. a lot of people don't talk about him. What can you tell us about the great Oliver Nelson? Oh, he was really great. I mean, <laughs> oh boy. He wrote, you know, the, he, he's done some really, different kind of albums because with the Eric Duffy and and him Stolen Moments. Yeah, oh yeah. Stolen Moments his 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 real contribution was great, great song. <laughs> and um, uh, oh 
I was recording with somebody and uh, uh, Oliver came in with a, a, a ranger and, uh, and he had an arrangement under his arm and he passed it out and we plated it down and it was still one moment and, and uh, we did one run through rehearsal and Thad played a solo on it in a straight mute. <laughs> it's a straight, nobody plays in a straight mute it's, except Louis Armstrong. Yeah. And Thad played his solo in a straight mute. And I thought, why didn't Louis? <laughs> oh, and uh, oh, and the the oh man, something. There's one one story runs into another sometimes, and the the um, Oliver. Oh. Oh, I did a J.J. A John Johnson album. It's a really good album. And, uh, and he, he, uh, he, he, in the J.J. Johnson album, uh, uh, J.J had written a, a score in concert. And by this time, just about all the ranges I knew was write, wrote, wrote transposed scores. And, and uh, J.J. asked his friend, uh, who was, he, he asked somebody about who who's a good copyist and somebody told him this guy is good copyist and the the guy the copyist did everything wrong he did every transposition wrong everything wrong so poor JJ he had to stand and read notes of of the score verbally so the guys in the band could correct him. And <laughs> I really felt sorry for him. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and, and then Oliver, Oliver came to that day and with some under, passed it out the arrangement and we played it down with one rehearsal Thad played a solo on, and 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 when 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 fi when we finished, <laughs> uh, uh, JJ asked Oliver, uh, yeah, Oliver, he said, do you write a transposed score? No, he says, yeah, always. Yeah. <laughs> JJ said, I'm learning something. <laughs> and the poor guy, he, he had to, we had to do three dates instead of two dates because of that. That was expensive back then too, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, that was all of JJ's, uh, 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 free money, all of his, uh, uh, what, what you, his, uh, all of his budget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh boy. Okay, what can you tell us about this person, Duke Pearson? Oh boy. Oh boy. You, you're good. <laughs> oh boy, you ask good <laughs> questions. Duke Pearson was beautiful. <laughs> oh. He, he liked the Yalta flute, too. He wrote stuff for the Yalta flute. Duke Pearson 
was an excellent writer, and he was different than the rest of the guys. Different than that, and it was more straight ahead, not as tricky stuff, but really good. And oh boy, he's oh, I don't get it. I don't I will try to do that. He he liked to write for the alto flute as well, and occasionally uh, there would be a new piece uh, on the, at a rehearsal uh, on the alto flute part. And I, I say, "What do you want to do for this? Let's play it." And he, he started playing. Oh boy. The Yalta flute um, uh, opened some doors for me, I guess. I really it was different. Yeah. 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 What are your thoughts? You had this amazing life in music. What do you? What can you uh, share? Words of wisdom for all these people here that are trying to do the same thing. Oh. Well. To do, to, to do what I did. I <laughs> did, I did. You have to be, be very lucky. I, I was lucky. A, a, a lot. I'm not just a little lucky, but really a lot. I'm a, unbelievable. And. Uh, well, you were lucky at the gambling table. You, you made yeah, $400, you right. right? Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, I'm really lucky. And you, do you know anybody that's had seven strokes that it, he's the world's one of the luckiest men in the world? Well, let me just say this. We feel lucky that you're here with us tonight. Thank you. So, Thank you. Gary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.